¿Sí? Okay. You will find different ways of doing it. I don't know, this is not so difficult if you just, you know, inch at a time. Very important because you learn how to respect one another, you learn how to respect the height, and also learn about your own little skills that, that you have. This is a moose hide, and I'm going to make a big drum. It's going to be beautiful. I'm getting this ready to stretch, so I gotta make the holes in here. I'm gonna put it on the stretcher. Yeah. I never grew up this way. And it surprised me because uh, in the north, they're closer to the land there. And I figure. Maybe I'd be learning things like this up there. And for it to be offered on the reserve, where I come from, I was surprised <coughs> by that, to come home and learn about this, rather than up north. This is uh, uh, the healthy lifestyle that uh, we want our kids to see today. Nature changes their attitude. <laughs> this is the fir my first experience, like skinning moose and doing all these search sorts of things. It was my first time skinning a moose, for the first time, and I enjoyed it. The elders taught me that uh, everything we need is here on the land, and. There's no such thing, uh, in, in the old ways, there's no such thing as garbage. Because everything had a purpose, everything was used. I think it's a wonderful experience that everybody should all come and partake, just, just to get that little bit of understanding. Even if they don't use this knowledge on a regular basis, they'll understand the amount of work that goes into working with those hides and getting them to that final stage of panning them where they can sew with them or use them for the sacred ceremonies. It's, it's very important. My name is Mike Sutherland and this is the community of Pegasus First Nation. My role is, um, is the land, the hunting, the gathering, the survival skills, you know, but also sustainability. We have a number of different culture camps, but this one's focused on uh, some of our traditional activities of, uh, you know, tanning hides and, and what we do with the deer when we hunt them. Uh, we try and teach our uh, participants that come in and it's more than just, you know, shooting a deer and eating the meat, you know, and uh, there's many ways of looking at preserving your meat and cooking your meat and so on, and also use, utilizing the hides that are there. My name is Dan Thomas and my community is Sagging First Nation. Here we, we learn about uh, how to work with a deer hide. But how, how were those deer hides acquired and uh, where did our people first learn to, to work with them? My name is Gary Stevenson. I'm from uh, Peguis First Nations. I was born here. I was raised here. I uh, lived here all my life. I heard a lot about uh, tanning hides, brain tanning. Um, I had a little idea of what it's about, what, what the process was, but I never actually seen it done. I was never involved with it. Uh, um, so when I got this opportunity to come and see it, I, uh, you know, I, uh, I came and uh, very glad to be a part of it. Uh, <clears throat> just to see exactly how it's done step by step right from right from uh, the start right to the end and I'm finding it's a lot of it's a lot of hard work it's, uh, we need a lot of patience um, it's time consuming it's uh, but at the same time very interesting and uh, enjoyable tanning hides the traditional way using the brains or bear fat is it can go back thousands upon thousands of years so when you come to traditional cultural teachings, I mean, you can't get any closer and better than this, something that's been passed down from generation to generation. 
getting all the background in there so that they, they know even how to take the brain out of the animal, how to apply it to the hide, what time, uh, to soak it, to stretch it, to see how, how well it works. And if it hasn't, they go back through the process again until they get it right and get the hide that they want. It. We want to make that reconnection with the land, what our, what our people, our ancestors had at one time. It's, a lot of it's been lost through the years. You could say it's like a traditional process, but it's also, uh, to me, an industrial process. And it, it's a, a scientific process because you this have to your, know the, the science of what you're right doing. Here. And I said industrial because it's a, it's a traditional technology that was developed thousands of years ago and people have, have used, and, and it works. And it doesn't create uh, any waste that comes off of the animals is just put out in the bush and it goes back to the earth because it's organic. Before contact, before the Europeans came over to Canada, uh, our Indian people were here and they lived a very prosperous life. Uh, <clears throat> they knew how to live on the land in their, in their habitat for thousands of years. There were hunters, there were gatherers, there were survivors, and they, and they lived, uh, you know, if, uh, if a culture can live for thousands of years, you know, they're, they're doing something right. People hunted moose and they hunted deer. I remember people having the hides stretched out, see other people working on the hides, and uh, they did use the, the brain and the fat from the animal to, to work the hide so that they could soften it. They were here and they, were, they prospered and they were healthy people. They were strong, they were good hunters, they raised healthy families. We also incorporated this year um, the uh, pr preparation of different game, wild game. You know, like we got a moose on a Sunday evening, so we uh, showed the, the students and the participants how to cut it up, skin it, cut out the nose and the tongue, you know, and then we uh, butchered the, the animal, and then we bottled some of the meat, we ground up some of the meat, uh, we uh, smoked some of the meat, and then we're going to be cutting the rest of it up and putting it away ready for frying or, or stewing meat. But we also have some fish, white fish and uh, gold ice, and we'll be preparing some of those tonight, cutting them, salting them, and getting ready for the smoker tomorrow. You know, so these are the different things that we provide those teachings to the people that participate in the, the program. And it's all, again, culturally based, right, the way we did things. My uh, name given to me by my parents is uh, Cheryl. And uh, my married name is Thompson. I'm here from Peguis. <laughs> Everything here on Mother Earth will go on. If we cease to exist as human beings, the plants, the animals, everything will go on. It is us who rely on everything that is here on Mother Earth to survive. They don't rely on us. So we have to, to learn about that balancing. Mm -hmm. and to learn how to nurture everything that Creator has provided for us, because Mother Earth, she provides everything that we need. We don't need the stores, we don't need anything. The pharmacies, it's all right here on Mother Earth if we know where to look. <laughs> Whatever they needed in life, they used hide for. And uh, the finished hide is one thing, but also they used the uh, raw hide for diff different tools that they would make. Uh, you can uh, wet the raw hide and wrap it and tie it. And when it dries, it, it's re really tight and strong. So. It's, it's almost like uh, you, you have a malleable plastic and you can work with it and when you're, you're done it's a really strong material. And in the end it's not going to uh, sit on the earth for thousands of years. It, it'll just disappear once you, you put it out somewhere when you're done with it. They use them for clothing. They use them for shelter. They use them for their ceremonies. So it was a way of surviving because back then we couldn't run to Walmart and <laughs> buy a new pair of shoes or a warm jacket. It was the, the animals that provided the clothing, so, and the shelter. My name is Strong Windman, Black Horse Warrior. I belong to the Fish Clan. 
You're going back to natural things. The natural things that are out there. And it's all there. You know, we never ever had to go run to the store for anything. We used the things that were there for us. The more natural it is, the more healthier it is, the more you feel that spirit of the, that connection. Clothing, um, shelter, tools, you know, it could be used for many different things. Footwear, you know, uh, the Plains Indians, the buffalo was the center of their universe. They provided shelter, clothing, food, tools, with all the bones. Same thing with the, uh, the moose and the for people in the forest. My name is Geraldine Cocker and, and what I do is I instruct um, the hide tanning, how to uh, do it, the hide tanning the traditional way. The moccasins were a, a big thing. You had to have a pair. The mitts are a big thing. The jackets also, uh, vests and uh, a lot of women on their Sunday best, they had to have the fancy hairpins made out of moose hide with a lot of fancy beadwork. You use deer hide for the wedding dresses with a lot of fancy beadwork and that. And they leave them white. You, you don't tan those. The moose hide is for heavier garments like vests, jackets. The best time to know your hides is in the fall. The hide is, gets thicker. And in the summer, the hide is very thin. My name is Ion Sutherland. I don't know much about the bell, but it's off the moose there. And they make uh, moose tuff tufflings or whatever they call it. So you make flowers and stuff out, out of them. And you can put it on the, uh, on the um, leather. So I can, you could get different colors, dye them and make flowers and patterns. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm so looking forward to be doing that this winter. With the moose, uh, they t the girls take the, the, the goatee, they use that to make that, that tuft artwork, you know, like caribou, tuft hair. Yeah, they'll use that in the moose as well. They're hollow. It's finding who they are, finding a spirit, and understanding who they are and how to work with it. So that's, you know, what I teach, uh, a lot of the spiritual part, try to help them find themselves and understanding their selves, their gifts, and it makes things easy in life because I know from experience. <laughs> My name is Sherry Francois. I'm fr originally from here, from Peguis. Sitting quiet and just uh, having time to think and reflect on life and think about how our people used to live. And to appreciate that, I guess, uh, I guess in a way, uh, it might might have been a good thing to lose our way. Because for it to come back and for us to appreciate the way that I do, it's uh, that's very uh, meaningful spiritually. I understand who I am as a First Nation, and one that's connected to the earth and everything around me. But I come to learn about tanning for the uh, ceremonies because we use these hides for our drums and for our rattles. And uh, I have a little boy water drum and the hide was wearing out and I didn't know where to go looking to find somebody who knew how to tan those hides in a natural way. So when I found out, heard about this workshop, then I knew that my prayers were being answered. I talked about the spirit of the animal you got to give thanks for that ones that gave themselves. And when you do that, it's, everything else seems to kind of work together, the, the connection with that hide, with those people, and every individual working on them. Reconnect our youth to the land and to their culture and way of life as to who they are. One of the things that we found in working with our youth and bringing them back here, whether it be, whether it be in the school or in the community, is that it really changes their perspective on life. Once they understand who they are, where they come from, and their practices, we find that uh, they're more proud of who they are. They're not ashamed, and they understand that, man, we have a significant and, and, a, and a major, major uh, background to us, you know, with a lot of history. When we get to young people here doing it and people involved, it's, it's something they're going to show their children. It's very important that we do this. and. 
and share it, especially with the young people, then that way it's going to be carried on. Knowledge that they're learning about uh, hides and about trapping, about fishing, hunting, uh, all of these things to me are the things that we need our, our kids to know. And uh, also to have our, our young people know that uh, the foods that come from the land are the healthiest foods and they're way healthier than the processed foods. This is what they need to know. They got to know their identity, you know. They, they, they need to know what our Dr. culture Rora, is. They have to uh, out here for you? <coughs> your night, know who they are and be proud of who they are, you know, as a people, as an as a Indian person. And it shows how people uh, are able to live with the environment instead of against the environment. Uh, I think in there they learn that there's scientific processes that our people had used historically and can still use today to uh, meet needs that they, they want. And I was really pleased uh, and it really touched my heart to have the young women and the young guys take part in this. They were skinning the moose and I would be able to share and explain some of the things as we were working along. Well the tubs is actually where we soak the hide and we don't use any chemicals, just natural water. And when you soak the hides, um, you're actually going to, when you flush it, after you flush it, after you have the water, it's sitting in water, it opens the pores. We had the, the hides prepared, we, we had skinned the animals, taken the hide off. We kind of prepped everything just for the people to come in. I've had them soak it for six days, getting them ready. Uh, and when you do soak it, you're breaking down the, the um, molecules in the hide, so you're actually opening the pores, so when you go to flush, uh, and take the hair off. It opens those pores so you can able to pull them off. Uh, they soaked the hides for, say, I think it was uh, five days, which wasn't long enough. They should have been in the water longer because uh, it's harder to take the hair off if you just leave it in the water for three days. The first stage is where we flush it. So when you flush it, you're actually opening the pores for when you go to take the hair off. You gotta clean all the flesh and the hair off of it uh, before you start scraping the hide. And uh, once you get it stretched on the stretchers, you know, you'll see that there are thin layers of skin. You wanna remove all that, th those one or two layers of skin to get down to the actual um, hide itself, the leather itself. And that could take anywhere from two to three days of scraping. It depends how enthusiastic and how long the people wanna work. Don't look at the whole hide and let it overwhelm you. Just look at that so little tiny horse. spot where you're working at. Okay, this is your traditional bone that you use to take the hair off of the hide. What you do is see how we have that filed in there to make little jagged edges. You hold it like this and you bring it down this way and you keep working all your hair down. That's what we use to take the, the hair off. Uh, I had an idea of, of fleshing and be hair. I never did it. So this is my first one. I think the scraping when you when you first start off, it's these hides have all the hair on one side, and you gotta you gotta get all that hair off it, and uh, it's a lot of a lot of scraping and a lot of pulling, and it's gotta come off. Eh? It has to come off. So you gotta you keep telling me, you know, you know, just do little at a time, little at be patient, and keep keep at it, and so that's what we've been doing. Eh? when you get that little moment of frustration that's time to stop put it away and start after again because the the more good thoughts and good efforts you put in it it'll work out a lot better for you and it's like anything else the more thoughts you give to people and show that respect you get it back very simple teaching once you know how to do every step the traditional way then if you know some shortcuts, you can go ahead and take them, but you will know the, the whole process in the background. When you get into being a little bit more professional, you will use the ulu. 
a lot of people will use a, a, a knife, whatever works for you. But I prefer to use this. The Inuit use this up north. That's what they use. And it's a very, very handy tool to have once you learn the hard way. Well, we work with knives on the first day, bones on the second day, bones with grooves, and the third day, the bones are for taking off the fur. Letting the animals chew off the legs, because uh, what I want to do with the front legs is that uh, between the, the hoof and the, the knee, the bone is uh, kind of long and straight, and there's a flat part at the bottom. And I take that bottom piece and I cut it on a 45 where it's flat, so you make an edge. And we use that edge to scrape the fat and the hair off Back the moose and it works really here. well. It's a natural oh. tool. The moose ones were working really well uh, because they're, they're big and they're the, the right size and weight. It will not cut and tear the, the leather. Yeah, so no matter how hard you push and scrape, it, it won't cut it. So that's a good tool to use, yeah. If there are scrapes in it, then you have weak spots there. So this way I, I get to have a hide that doesn't have weak spots in it and you can use it for a much longer time. They showed us how to saw the bones and uh, even to put grooves in them so they could pull the hair better. Like all those little details, are, like, they're so nice to know and it's such a good feeling like, to know that I'm actually standing. doing it and actually learning it and actually using bones. When they start to work with the hides and they, they have a purpose, of what they're working towards that end goal for, then it, they stay focused. You say your prayers and you put your tobacco down and you know, and things will will come to you in a way, eh? And I could have went and bought a big drum, but it wouldn't have meant really that much, you know, and unless I put my, my sweat, my work, my prayers all in this, this drum I'm making. And it's gonna take a long time, but it's gonna be so worth it. And it's gonna be part of my, like our family, my family, so. I'm hoping it'll be passed down, you know, that'll, that drum will be sacred. When I came into this workshop, I had my goal. I knew what I was going to do with this hide from, from the start right to the finish. So every day I get more and more excited because I'm getting closer to that end result. Eh? So it's, it's uh, exciting for me. The big drum, I want to have it for our family to have a big drum so we could sit around and sing songs like me and my sisters and my close family members. I think we're softening it up. Softening it up. Breaking the fiber. Yeah, that's what we're doing now. We're breaking all the fibers in there to make it soft and pliable. So it'll be easy to work with, eh? And I, for myself, I challenge it with my hands, I have weak hands. So to work this way and not to give up, eh? Because I always think of that end result. Just keep going. <laughs> and that end result, eh? I'm always looking to that end result. And I'll be very surprised when I see it. I guess hands-on is the best way to learn. So you start to figure things out. You don't know what to do at first, but then we figured it out. And it's kind, kind of similar to what they call flushing here taking the fat and flush off the inside of the deer. When I skin the animals or do any flushing with them, I stay connected to the earth. I stand on Mother Earth and I lay the animal down because it walks. And when I skin it on there, that connection from the animal, from the earth, runs through me and I give thanks as I go along. You want to make sure everything is off there. It's, it's got to be just smooth on both sides, you know, and, and, and white looking, you know. And then once you get it to that stage and you're ready to move on to the next where you start washing it, cleaning it off, washing all the grease out of there. It's very exciting to be able to work with these skins because they all have spirit. Each, each animal, everything that creator has made has spirit. And to work with this deer hide, she has a spirit, she has a life. And she's gonna guide me and she'll teach me because that spirit is still there. So when I use her, She'll continue to talk to me. You can talk to them as you're working on them, and they'll guide your hands along the way. And as I work with the hide, I'm, I'm speaking to it in my mind, eh? I'm talking to it so I can make that 
connection with that spirit of that animal. Right? So it's always very important to me is making that connection. You always got to wonder, if you're taking that down too far or not far enough? Not far enough. And once you get the, uh, that hide scraped onto the, the leather that what you want, the actual raw hide, then you, you wash it, you clean it, you know, and it's, and it's a beautiful white color. And that's just about ready to go. And then uh, you uh, smoke it. And then you put it back on the stretcher again. When and it'll be hard. Then they stretched it and then they dried it out, re-scraped it to try get all the, the skin. As you can see on this one, there's still a bit of skin on there that has to come off. And then on the last days, you, you work the hide loose, you know. And that's where the work comes in a lot of the work with the hands and that's what needs to be done eh? the hide has to be stretched loosened up because as you soak and it dries it it uh, shrinks right so you got to bring it back out and once they get it to the nice loose stage and then you have your pliable leather this is a deer hide and it we're taught that that uh, drum brings balance because you can't walk too much on the spiritual side but you cannot work walk too much on the uh, earthly side you have to walk that balance. To know that this deer uh, had its own life, it had its own family, uh, it had its own, own way of being on the earth, and then it's caring enough to, to give us its, its life so we can have life. And then to know that uh, uh, our elders also told us we're supposed to be like that in life, that. Uh, we're supposed to care for ourselves, care for others. She teaches us to be gentle. She, she provides a lot of our, our substance for our nourishments and our clothing and, and also for ceremony. So that drum teaches us that balance to walk down the center because it also teaches you from the, the trees where that uh, drum comes from trees and the hide and everything that's used in there, it all, all stems to life. The medicines that we use in that drum, the water, uh, nothing can survive without the water. This water is life. They use the brain of the animal and then they say that uh, for each animal it has just enough brain to tan its hide. <laughs> and to me it's the uh, fat that's in the brain that causes a, a change in the structure of the, the, uh, the hide to make it turn to leather from, from uh, just from hide. And so th there's, there's a process that you go through and here they're teaching them the, the oldest process where you have to do every little part by hand, uh, including plucking the hair off the hide by hand. The brain is, there's a lot of like oil and the fatty tissue in there. And that's what you melt down to make it into like the grease that you rub on there. You take the contents of the brain, you smash it all up, you know, you kind of use like a mixer and, and you smash them all up and that's what you rub on to the hide to, to, to put that, uh, that grease in there to make it pliable. It softens the hide. Mm. And it helps with the, the smoking faster. There's a surface membrane on the hide. That's what has to come off so the grease can go through. So if they didn't get it all off, that's when they have to go back and, and we scrape it and start the process again. To do a hide like this, you need at least maybe uh, two uh, deer heads, you know, the brains, to do a hide this big. When you're um, cutting out a moose and you cut the belly open, if you open it up, you'll see that there's kind of a webbing around that moose's belly. Okay, it's kind of like a net that holds everything in place. If you could, if you could salvage that netting from that moose, that is really good stuff to use. It is it's very um, high in, I guess, uh, fatty substances. And then from there, you boil that, or you could boil it and melt it down, and then you rub that in just like a bear grease. Yeah. But it's, it's the grease or the oil that softens up the hide, it souples it up, eh? They use different kinds of uh, oil. Uh, I know at one time we boiled fish and used the oil out of the fish, skimmed that off and used that on the hides. 
but usually to find some natural oil to use on the hide and then uh, today they're going to be soaking the hides in warm water, the ones that have had the, the uh, bear grease applied to them this time. And uh, they'll be washed and then they'll be stretched and then the, the stretching process will show how well the grease went right into the hide and if it didn't go in then that's when they have to do it again. The idea is to, to know that there are different methods you could use uh, to, to grease up those hides to make them supple and more pliable to work with. And once that's done, everything's off of there, you know, and you got that stuff in there and you, you uh, dry it off and then you wash it. I was sharing a little bit with uh, some of the people about how our people were such a humble and uh, how the, uh, I guess the teaching of humility because it takes patience to do a lot of this work. And a lot of people don't understand that there is spirit in everything. And each one of these different hides have spirit. And they will guide you, they will teach you. You just have to learn to listen. And that's something we lack is learning to listen. And now they uh, let uh, the grease soak in overnight near the heat. So this morning what they're doing is they're putting it in water. This is how your hide is going to turn out after you soak it in the water. See what you're doing is you're softening it, you're washing it, you're getting it ready for to stretch it. And once you get it all that stuff clean then you use a you wrap it and you use a couple of sticks and you wind those sticks up wrapped around the hide. Yeah, so you make a really tight rope kind of thing and you just squeeze and squeeze it and squeeze it to get that uh, water out of there. And when they're twist drying it, actually what they're doing is they're breaking that fine skin that you left behind when you were scraping. See where it's all dark, all these dark patches, that's the skin that was left behind that has to come off in order to get it like this. This nice, is nice and soft. This is where you're taking all the water out of it. But we're doing it all in the natural way. It's one, one step at a time. So after this is done, then we proceed into the last stage of the hide tanning and that would be the smoking. And what they do is they, um, just make a small little smudge, not right, fire. Wow, it's got to be smoke, and you wrap this hide around yeah, that smudge, and you let it sit there for maybe a couple hours. It depends on how dark you want your hide. You smother that fire with rotten spruce, so it'll be easy. and if you break open that rotten spruce tree, you'll see it's all red inside the bark. Well, that's where you're going to get that tan color from, from the smoke. So you make a teepee, you make wooden racks, and you lay your hide on there for a couple of hours, and then you flip it over. It'll give it a nice, uh, nice brown color, and a, to me, a really nice smell. But you gotta have an intense smoke inside of there because that's what's going to get into that, that leather. Yeah, and then you get onto the final stages again of stretching it and drying it, you know, and after it's dried and hard, that's when you start working the leather. And uh, that's day. the final stage is, is, is working that day. hide by hand. And the bigger the hide, the longer it takes. Mm, you're done. It sounds easy, but it's not easy. It's time consuming, a lot of hard work, a lot of frustrations, but that's entirely up to you. If you put your mind to it and say, I'm going to do this hide, this is what the results will be. But if you sit here and you go through eight days of labor working on that hide, you'll think $300 is nothing. That hide is priceless, but <laughs> by all the work that you put into the hide, so to me that's, that's the big thing is that you see the value uh, of it because of the work that you put into it. This is just beautiful. This is nice and soft. It's workable. You can put a needle through it with the beads. You're not going to be sitting there fighting, you know, to pull beads through. So it could be three weeks, you know, you have a moose hide or a big bull elk, you know, 
or it could be a couple of days for just for a deer. It all depends on how much work you put into it and the way you do it. I have more uh, respect now actually for the big drum because there is a lot of work put into it, like lots of work, you know, it's not just a, a drum. You know how people just hand tobacco or money and, you know, want this big drum, but if you actually do the work, it's like totally different meaning. I didn't have that whole process in my head. And I remember trying a few times when I was younger to, to hand tan the hides using the brain and it didn't work. I either, uh, I don't know, I might have soaked the hides too long or maybe the hides were, uh, were, were not uh, fresh hides. But they, they didn't work, so now coming here I see the whole process and now I know how you, you do a hide. <laughs> <laughs> this here, the traditional way, this is forever. We have one main instructor, Gerilyn, and uh, since she's our instructor, she's like our, our base, our foundation, but then there's other people that come along, oh no, you should do it this way, oh no, you should do it this way, oh no, you should do it this way, and they're just like... Sometimes it gets confusing, but at the same time, when you get to that stage, then you understand what they're talking about. So it's good that everybody finds their own ways and to appreciate everybody's teachings. That um, is my quiet time. That's when I think a lot, when I'm all alone doing my hides. I think a lot, I think about, well, you know, what am I gonna do with this hide? It's just relaxing for me. I enjoy that. My family is one of the last hunters and gatherers in our community. We'll fill a freezer full of berries, another freezer full of fish, another one full of waterfowl, and then, you know, there'll be another freezer or two full of deer, moose, and elk. And uh, we will use it all throughout the winter. And a lot of the times uh, we will share a lot of that stuff with our elders. And my wife has a huge family, so a lot of it will be shared within the family. You take what you need, because greed will never get you nowhere in life. I, and that was one of the first teachings that my dad shared with me. My grandfather never took too much from his trap line. He always ensured there was something there for next year and the years to come. You know, but he, he took enough to make a living off of for his family. Money is not important in life. Because if you look within yourself, you aren't made out of money. And that spirit is not made out of money. So when money was never an issue, is always learning and being and living a good life as best you can. It's nice to see somebody's heart in, in, uh, in what they're doing. You know, as Aboriginal people, um, eating healthy but also living healthy is so important because diabetes, heart disease, you know, and many other illnesses run rampant in our communities. A lot of the animals live in the water. They eat the, the herbs under the water plants. All those herbs that they eat are in your body, so it's a natural thing. Muskrats eat wike. Wike is a medicine. Deer in the summertime eat milkweed or uh, sow thistle. That's a medicine, you know. And uh, the moose, uh, you know, they live in the provide with a vegetation within the waters. A lot of our medicines grow in the water. And in the winter time, they go into the swamps and they eat the shrubs and the, the small growth that grow in there, but the swamps are full of medicine. It's kind of a mixture of salt and a few other little things, I guess. It's a really good way of uh, adding variety to your food, you know, but also maintaining that good, healthy um, way of living, eating that wild game. Some of the moose meat that was uh, cut up was smoked, and so we were able to see the uh, the process, uh, how they smoke the meat, and uh, what kind of uh, wood to use to ensure that you you have a good flavor when you uh, smoke the meat. In in this case, we used uh, rotten spruce to to smoke the meat. And if you use uh, another tree, you may have uh, a bitter taste or a sour taste to the meat, so you don't want that. 
but spruce will give you the taste that you, you want. A certain way you have to cut the meat because uh, you, when you slice it, you have to slice it uh, against the grain because when you put it over, it lays open so it, the smoke goes through and it, it's a, a slow process and it cures it the meat. The smoke gives it the flavor and the smoke keeps the flies away from the meat. After that's done, you bag it in brown paper bags and you keep it someplace cool. What dad used to do, we made a homemade cellar, you know, just dug a hole in the ground and covered. And that was our preserved food. There was no fridges back then. We didn't have deep freezes. So we had to do something to preserve this food. Smoking meat is it's, it's, it's a, it's a slow progress thing, but it takes time. And that's where the teaching of humility and patience, and that's one of our sacred teachings in life. You got the moose meat in. You cut it up into little chunks, little cubes. And you're gonna get some potatoes, small potatoes. If they're a little too big, you cut them up a little smaller. And you use carrots, cut them up, and onions. Kind of cut them up for it. If they're small <laughs> onions, you give them whole. Eh? And you're gonna get your, your, uh, your sealers ready, sealers with the caps. And you need lard. And uh, you put the uh, the meat, the potatoes, the onions, the carrots, and the in the sealers. Then you put your salt, uh, the, uh, a tablespoon of like coarse here. salt, and a tablespoon of lard, right on top of that thing. Seal up the jar, and you're gonna have. You're doing about. You're doing about ten, uh, a dozen of jars. Then you got your big pot full of water. You get it boiling. Then you put your jars in there and you boil them for four hours. And and that's it. After four hours, they're, they're ready. They're, uh, you can keep them right in the cupboard. You don't have to refrigerate them. Six months down the road, two months down the road, you can open it up and have a good meal. So that's, 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 how, that's how simple it is to do. But unless you see it, unless you do it and take part in it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know how to do it. The fish, yeah, it's uh, pretty basic. I mean, you get your white fish or your gold eyes, and you clean them. The, I uh, just cut the gold eyes on the side, down the, just down the side of the body, just so that the, 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 they could be cooked because you want to throw them in whole. You know, the white fish, um, people use, sometimes cut them up the middle, split the bone, and open them up. Well, uh, when Gerilyn came, uh, when we got her working with our program, she brought a different method. And I heard of it before, but I never did it. It's a butterfly method where they cut from the back by the fins and they cut around to the belly. There. You see how I did that? I cut just above that, that, and this is your bones right here. So there's not going to be any bones in your smoke fish. Then you flip it over, you do the same thing on this side. You lay the fish down and it should all come out fairly easy. So. That's it. Here's your fillet. And then you hang it or else you put it on the racks and you smoke it and it's a wonderful way to do fish. Much easier. But I just put a little salt on them, soak them overnight and then we put them on a smoker and let them smoke for a day or sometimes a day and a half. It depends on how big your smoker is and how much fish you have in there. bunch of us cousins get together and this is what we do. We learn from each other new ways. I look forward to coming every day here, you know, just uh, sharing, you know, with the, well, the food and stuff is here, and you, know, you got your friends are here, you know, and just taking part in all the stuff. It's, 
It's a lot of fun. You hear them laughing and being social. And it's uh, <laughs> nice to be with other people. It's nice to visit. It's nice to get to know them. So that's another spiritual aspect of it. And, and just to think how the women were back then. I shouldn't say women. How the people were back then. But I imagine women sitting together and doing this. And thinking how hard this work is. It's, it's very time consuming. Like it, it's, uh, it takes a long time. And I think... Way back then, I could imagine all these women sitting together, working on one hide and making making uh, the process a little bit faster. And ah! <laughs> You're pulling me right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's working. It is a natural thing from, passed out from my grandmother, my mother, and now myself. And I share that knowledge with my kids as well. I'll keep, continue to work with the hides, share that knowledge with our nieces and nephews. They're always willing to learn, and they always have questions, and they want to know why. Why do you? Why do we do things this way? So it's to teach them to be connected, but to walk in that balance. Who lived here? What did they do? So it gives you a whole sense of belonging to this this place, this country that we have. And I think those are all important ideas that we want to instill in the young people and to give them ideas about how uh, what you learn here can be applied in the, in the world out there. Just learning the, uh, how to make the meat, the dry meat, the, you know, the pickled meat and all that stuff. So I think it's a really important part for me to learn so I could try to pass it on to my children. They show their children or their friends or their neighbors, whoever, show them how to do this and keep it going. Because this is, a, I could say it's a dying art that we will eventually lose one day if nobody's there teaching the younger generation about how to do the Hajj tradition traditionally. The camp provides many different perspectives and we talk about a lot of this. We share it around the table as we're working. You know, and we pass on that knowledge to, to somebody else or those understandings to other people so they can carry it away. In a lot of ways, I think uh, the feeling that you have doing it is the reason why it needs to be revived. Because when, when you're working, like when you're taking off the fur or when you're taking off the fat and just, uh, it's kind of like uh, being at peace. Um, just being with yourself, just being close to the land. The work that's being done is just a part of these teachings. A person will come away from this with a much more greater perspective, you know, and, and, and more than just learning about tanning a hide. As strong as they are, there's still a lot of people that, uh, you know, that need to, need to get back to our ways of our people, eh? With the land, uh, how important uh, the reconnecting with the land is. You could put me out on the land, there's no problem, I'm going to survive. You know, I could make the shelters, we could tan the hides. We do what we need to do to, in order to survive up there. I know how to cure the meat, you know, smoke it, uh, tan it. I mean, uh, smoke it, bottle it, grind it up or whatever. I could do that. Same with the fish. What if tomorrow we had no electricity? What if tomorrow something happened where uh, we couldn't have food delivered to the store? Uh, how are our people in our communities going to eat uh, how, how are they going to be uh, able to say, sustain themselves? Uh, if they're learning this, they know that they're, they always have something they can fall back on. We're gatherers and we still, we still subside off of Mother Earth. Even though we drive trucks and we live in modern houses, our diet, our way of life, our belief systems are all connected to the land. We've all been colonized, you know, and we lost all these things, especially the language, you know our ways of our people, our reconnection with the land. This is all what we, what we needed, what we need to survive. I think all the things that are involved in this process give people the, the skills, the behaviors, everything that they're going to need to be survivors. Hey guys, on behalf of our camp and uh, my family and yours, I want to uh, show you a little a token of our appreciation here and uh, offer you a braid of sweetgrass. 
Well, I'd like to say thank you to each one, each one of the uh, instructors that were there. Yeah, I'm grateful for getting to know everybody, spending the week with two of my cousins, Iona and Cheryl, and uh, my stepfather, Gary. So I want to thank the cooks. You know, if it wasn't for the cooks, we wouldn't be having these wonderful meals. I'm glad I had the opportunity to, to come and cook for all these people. It turned out very good for me. And I'm really proud of uh, Wayne and Mike and what they're doing, Sherilyn. I think it's very important that we that we learn our traditions and culture. Um, I think one day we're probably going to have to go back to the land. Oh, and I'd like to thank Gary for giving me this. He didn't want, he, he'd rather give it to me than split it in half. Even though I'm one of the instructors, I created the camp, I do all the work to prepare it, but I also come here and host this to learn too from it. I'd like to thank uh, Mike Sarland, um, the school board, uh, for giving me this opportunity to be here as a, as a teacher and bringing students here as well. You know, I, one of the, the best partners that we have and have had for the last three or four years is MF NERC. Just for the fact that they're a vehicle that could take some of these teachings and, and move forward with them and take them into other communities and help resurrect things like this in other communities as well. Without that sponsorship, I know that workshops like this that are badly needed don't happen. That uh, dollar gets in the way. And so I want to thank that organization for their, their, their financial uh, backing of this workshop to make it possible for us. So we meet again is what we're always told. And acknowledging friends, family, relationships with other people in different communities, I'd like to thank you all. Thank you much.